That was somewhat underwhelming. Hopefully afterwards I'll get a bigger applause. Of course, that was my ego talking. Uh, so behavioral finance is, is largely about managing ego. Um, so Wednesday, 2 o'clock, the Fed min minutes come out. And the market decides that instead of tightening in March, now it's going to be June. We have this massive rally. Technically, if we didn't look at that event and just looked at the charts, we would see this big reversal day and we'd all get really excited as technical analysts, correct? Yeah? How many people thought Wednesday was a big reversal day to the upside? Now, you got it? Participation. If you're not going to participate, get out. How many people thought Wednesday was a big reversal day? The reason most of you aren't putting up your hand is because you know yesterday it reversed to the downside. Okay? But if this was Wednesday, if I was presenting yesterday, more hands would have gone up. I promise you that. And that's hindsight bias. So a lot of uh, what of Professor uh, Talfer covered very well um, is, is the, the high level of what this stuff uh, d does. I, I want to talk to you today for the next uh, 45 minutes or so about more practical applications, things that I've learned. Um, I, a couple of the books that a uh, professor mentioned, uh, Nassim Tlaib, who wrote The Black Swan, wrote Fooled by Randomness, about 2002, 2001. I read that book. It was eye-opening for me. And what I've learned about behavioral is that, you know, if I made a trade Wednesday and say, ah, saw that reversal pattern, okay, and I made the trade, I went long, and yesterday we had the reversal to the downside and I stopped out. Was I right or wrong? Any, was I right? I was right. How many think I was wrong about the markets? W was it a good trade? Was it a good trade that I made? I went in on the reversal, it reversed to the downside, I stopped out. Was that a good trade? It was a fantastic trade. If I'm still long right now, that's the problem. Okay, because I didn't follow the plan. The plan is there's a reversal, okay, high probability trade, get in, didn't work, get out. So it's the execution of the, all the indicators, of all the, the rules, of all the heuristics, of all the biases. It's the execution that makes it successful. You know, when they, when they study portfolio managers in returns, you know, they look at the top uh, quartile of portfolio managers going back in history. Okay? And then they look at the returns over a 10-year window and then go back and look individually each year. And of the top quartile performers over a 10-year window, somewhere in that 10 years, for three years, they were in the bottom quartile and many of them in the bottom decile. Why? Because it doesn't work all the time. Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, an example you used, fantastic. You, you can't argue with that over the long run. But since 1998, on average, hasn't beat the S&P. So is he good or bad? Is he losing it? Is he getting senile? You know, answer is sometimes the style works, sometimes it doesn't. And so we have to get over ourselves, really. None of us are really good at this. Where, where we get good at it is our ability to execute. So wanted to, uh, to bring it up there. Now, how many people can read this? Let's do this quickly. Does anybody who can't read that? You all get that? It's amazing how the mind works, isn't it? And so I'm going to spend some time here talking about the mind because what I felt and what I've learned over the last decade or so is that self-awareness, understanding who you are, as a, uh, whether you're a sell-side analyst, which I was for most of my career, last eight years managing portfolios, I currently manage about just under half a billion dollars. And I'll tell you, being a sell-side analyst and running money, not even close to being the same thing. It's so easy for us to write a report and say, oh, different pattern, it's changed. But when your money's on the line and you've got a fiduciary obligation to your client, completely different set of emotions. If you don't understand that, you're missing the point. So is Bob in the room, by the way? I saw him last night. OK. So obviously, we have a, a very rigid thinker, Mr. Prector, who thinks logically. 
He thinks in waves. And then you have me over here who's sometimes scattered and, and thinking about donuts. Okay? And so how you think about and how you process investing is really critical here. Okay? So how many people are very rigid in their analysis? Hands? Okay, you've all got significant ego bias. Get out. Okay? <laughs> because you, you, and very likely, you're going to have difficulty admitting that you're wrong. And if you're over here, then you really don't have a chance because you just, you need uh, confirmation bias. You need someone else to tell you you're doing it right. Because you, you don't have a plan. Okay, so somewhere in the middle is, is where you want to ultimately be, but uh, checking your ego at the door. So when you're making an investment, what, what do you think about? If the dealer's got a four in blackjack and you're the guy in the middle and you got a six and a four, what do you do? Anybody want to tell me? Come on, participation, folks. You hit. Anybody else? Did I hear someone say double? You double down because the odds are that the dealer's going to bust. Now, if the dealer had a six, even better odds, right? This game has to be about a probabilistic model, not about we're bullish, we're bearish, how we feel about it, our gut instincts, whatever it is, our point and figure count for that matter. Why? Because when we get it right and we're good at this, we get it right 55 or 60% of the time. The best of us get it right that much. But we get it wrong, therefore, an awful lot of time. 40, 45 percent. And so what do we do when we get it wrong to mitigate the downside? Okay, and so think about it. You've got to be thinking about it from a probability standpoint. Now, everybody has seen variations of this cycle. We understand that when the markets are going up, we all feel good about it. When the markets are going down to some degree, at some point, everybody's got a pew point. Everybody can't take it at some point. And that's why when we look at charts, we tend to see rounded tops, right? Because the emotion isn't as volatile at the top as it is when we have the loss. Why? Because of what Kahneman told us in loss aversion theory, why he won the Nobel Prize in economics 2002. It's because we puke it up at the bottom and at the top, we're kind of not sure. Some of us are really happy. Some of us are starting to get nervous. In fact, there's a chemical release in the brain. And there was a study done, which I'm going to share with you um, on this. So Warren Buffett says, you know, basically, as long as you've got uh, reasonable intelligence, it's about managing your emotions that are critical. And so investors should try to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. They've proven this under studies using fMRI, for example. And I'll share one with you. So in this study done recently, and there was a link there, that previous link there will take you to the study. Uh, and I think IFTA will share uh, that with you if, you if you're interested. So they took 20 participants, and they trained them uh, about number of times, 16 times through this test run. And effectively, they were giving, given some paper money and some paper securities. And they had a button like this, buy, sell, and hold. And as the markets are going up and down, they're told to hit the buttons, buy, sell, and hold. Okay? So that's effectively the study. And then in each case, they took two or three people, and they, they moved it around, and it was random, and it was all very statistical, as academic studies are. And they had functional MRI on. And with that, they mapped what was going on in their brain. A year and a half ago, I participated in a study like this. Um, it was more for health reasons, not my personal health reasons, but the study was created for that. There's a hospital in Toronto. It's the number one brain research center in the world, uh, the Baycrest Hospital. They've created this thing called the virtual brain, and where they've put out thousands of people around the world different demographics, different cohorts, and they've got this virtual brain. They've computerized the brain. So imagine if someone's had a trauma, uh, sports injury, popped in the head, you've got a concussion. They can now see which parts of the functionality of the brain are working well and not working well. 
okay, if you've had a stroke. So the benefits from this have come from the health side. I'm working with the scientists there to create an application more based on the financial aspects of making decisions. Um, it's probably going to take me another five or ten years to, to work through this all, but I, I think the, the, one of the keys to success on putting your feet up and sitting on an island is, is managing the emotion side. It's getting the execution right. So they did this study, and what they found was um, that they, they, they took all the returns based on all the people in the study, and they ranked them in groups, uh, best returns, the intermediate returns, and the low returns. And so the people who were on the low end of the returns, they tended to be momentum investors. So when it was going up, they were chemically releasing in their brains something to stimulate their emotional. It came from the amygdala. And they, were, they wanted to buy when it went up. And the guys in the middle, they actually didn't do much of anything. Very passive, very docile. Under fMRI, they weren't getting a lot of shocks one way or the other. And the people that were most successful tended to be counter traders, i.e. they bought early and they sold near the highs. There was something in their brain that they actually found out, um, and it's this thing called uh, the nucleus accumbens, uh, probably mangling that name. Um, but there's a, a chemical release in that part of the brain that makes, gives you some anxiety. And so when, when the markets were going up, people who were already long had more of that chemical release than other people. In fact, the group that were the momentum buyers were buying as these people were selling. And they were getting uh, their parts of their brain lighting up that were more momentum, more from the amygdala. Okay, it came more from the uh, fight and flight mechanism of the brain. So the conclusion from studies like this and others is that we're all made up very differently. Some of us have the ability to do this really well and some of us don't. But it can be learned through things like neuroplasticity, for example. We can train our brain. So understanding that the market's smarter than we are, um, self-awareness is the key. It's not a new indicator, folks. Okay, we don't need a new RSI deviation, one that takes 18 days instead of 14, because that's a better back test fit, or whatever. We don't need a new indicator. I think we have enough stuff out there to measure most of what the market does on a day-to-day -day basis. The key is going to be how we execute it. And it's, it's, it's your own ability. And, and a lot to do with how your brain's wired. And again, we, we can change those things. But So the professor covered a lot of these topics, and I'm not going to go into any great detail on them. That's not the, po uh, the point. I wanted to take some actually real examples um, and give you some insight into uh, how, I, how I've done and uh, been able to manage these things and, and hopefully eye-opening for you. So I see a chart like this and someone shows it to me. I know that I can't trade this. I've learned that I can't trade this and certainly stick with the trend. Okay, and I'll come back to this chart later. Maybe you can think about why I can't trade this. So talked about overconfidence, okay? Look in the mirror and you see something that maybe isn't there. This, is, is, this has got to be the worst because it, it, it stops us from executing well. It stops us from following our rules if we're rules-based. And really, uh, being, having a set of rules to guide you, uh, there was a question about how do you manage that you know, on the emotional side. And it is, it's keeping a trading journal and having a set of rules to follow so that the emotional quotient is down. I used to sit on a trading desk, trading a prop desk uh, book for a bank. I, I rarely look at the markets during the day. Yeah, I got to keep up with it, I got to watch. And by the way, the S&P futures are down 55 points right now. So if anybody needs to go make a trade, you should leave now. No, actually, that's not true. But who cares, okay? If you have a plan and rules, it shouldn't matter what's going on, okay? I know my, tr my trading desk in the office, they know if X, Y, and Z happens, they gotta execute. I sit down after the markets are closed, 
at night in North America and kind of review what happened during the day. Ah, there's an opportunity. Let's go make that trade. It's a high probability trade. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Who cares? I know that if I make enough high probability trades, they're going to work. And so that takes the emotional level way, way down. So here's a test if you're overconfident. Are you a better than average driver? Are you a better than average worker? Are you a better than average lover? Okay, the third one's really tough, actually, isn't it? <laughs> who, 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 who thinks they're a below average lover? <laughs> okay, let's ask your spouse. See if we get a different response. Um, so, you know, in, in Montier's book, um, he goes through a bunch of these things, and they did this study with 300 of the top portfolio managers, uh, I believe in Europe, and they asked them these, all these questions, and uh, then they looked at how they responded to the questions, and then they looked at the results over history to see who had ego, who had biases, and very interesting study, and if you haven't read Montier's book, very highly recommended. Um, so, Overconfident investors have trouble taking losses. And I brought up a chart here of British Petroleum. In Canada, I show the chart of Suncor, uh, which is the large, largest Canadian component of the energy sector. But if, you, if asked, you would look at this and you'd say, wow, you know, how many people in, in uh, the UK would have British Petroleum in their portfolio? Well, it, it's the biggest energy component in the index. Like, you're all going to have it in there maybe to a greater or lesser degree, but you're all going to have it. The reality is you've made no money over 15 years, right? So again, looking at uh, confidence and overconfidence, if, uh, if you can't say that, I, I just don't want to own this thing. If, if you're um, looking at a chart like this anyways, no growth for 15 years, it's kind of like Walmart was. You saw Walmart for the past decade and a half just be this big range trader until recently. And, and kind of identifying what the tendency is of a stock and tailoring your technical work to the behavior of the stock is, is very helpful. Okay, don't fall in love with the stock. I think we've heard that. We heard that earlier today. You can't actually fall in love with the stock. You must trade it. It's a commodity, okay? It's, it's something that we can rent for a period of time, and if we're making money, great, and if we're not, uh, move on. We'll I'll talk a little bit about anchoring bias as well, but if you bought this at 500 at some point over the last, oh, I don't know, it doesn't matter really, it traded there many times, and it's currently at 468. I mean, we all have this overwhelming bias. I gotta make a profit on it. I gotta get out, right? I gotta take, I gotta get, profit. What you should be asking yourself and telling yourself is, yeah, I own this today, but can I sell this and buy something else that's going to potentially go up more? Right? And that's the idea of relative strength. So it, focusing on relative strength analysis is going to help you, I believe, uh, minimize your emotional quotient uh, in terms of the investing terms of being too overconfident. So that's one thing I've learned, okay? Then you've got the confirmatory bias, and this is the, almost the complete opposite of being overconfident. You almost have no confidence, and you're looking for someone else to validate, okay? So um, understanding that the best investors are correct 55% of the time. Do you tend to disregard other opinions? Do you care what other people think of, of your investment? And if, if you fall into any of these sort of questions, then just ask that about yourself, okay? For example, you know, CNBC's on. You've got a position in a certain stock and another talking head comes on and they, they're really bullish on it. And you, oh, you walk over and you turn it up. You say, oh yeah, I wanna hear that. Why? Because it validates your view. Whereas if that person on TV was saying, no, that's a, that's a piece of crap, I don't want to own that, you just kind of, oh, that guy's an idiot, and you turn the volume down. What, when you're in a position, what you should be doing is looking for reasons why you are wrong, not why you should pat yourself on the back, okay? Because maybe you're wrong, and that's, that, that's probably a very helpful way of framing it and thinking about it. So... 
rather than taking that and saying, ah, the guy at Goldman, yeah, he agrees. I, I'm good with that, right? What you want to do is look at the report and say, you know what? There's some downside risk here maybe I'm not considering and factor that in. So in fMRI studies, um, women actually, and I guess we heard some of this before, but women uh, when stressed tend to secrete oxytocin. Men when stressed tend to uh, secrete uh, more adrenaline. And it's a different part of the brain that does that. We, we don't have a choice really, it's the way it is. Um, but oxytocin um, helps us actually make more cal calmer decisions. And adrenaline actually increases our anxiety. So chemically, women should be better at this than men. So my first prediction, 25 years from now at IFTA 42 or whatever it is, um, there should be more women in the audience than men. It should be a natural evolution. Okay, so self-attribution bias, we heard a little bit about this, where you tend to want to blame other people. So do you, do you tend to blame, when, so when a trade goes wrong, do you yell at your trader? Do you, do you get mad at the analyst who gave you the recommendation? Do you brag about your trades when you, when you are making money, when you're a winner? Do you argue about the market with others? Okay, so this is kind of the ego mechanism. And if you understand that, and I, I think I'm pretty good at this game, forget the ego thing for a second, my track record is that I get 60% right when I make a forecast, okay? But the rub is I don't know the next forecast whether that's gonna be right or wrong, okay? I, do, I just don't know. Someone sent me a tweet the other day. Uh, so I do a TV show in Canada everywhere. It's a half hour show. Uh, it's based on technical analysis and people call in and I, I don't throw things and hit buy, buy, buy buttons like Kramer, but it's that kind of thing where people call in and ask. And um, so someone tweets, he says, I, you know, great call on the energy sector, great call on the financials recently. I'm a big believer in what you do. And, and so, yeah, you only get 140 characters and maybe he didn't completely explain himself, but based on two recent calls that I made, he was sold. So statistically, that's nonsense, right? Because six months ago, I was negative on energy too and it, was keep, it kept going higher. And had he saw those in real time, he may have dismissed me as a fool, right? So again, the way people process things, mm, there, there's some challenges there. But um, the guy who has the self-attribution problem, you know, it's... Okay, so there's the sell signal we saw uh, in the report, the uh, Goldman report. Uh, and a couple days later, I knew it, and then, you know, moves to new high. Oh, that damn analyst. Okay, damn it. And of course, that's all with high, the benefit of hindsight. So when, when we're trading and executing, uh, when I teach people about this stuff, you're trading the hard right edge of the chart. Given that chart today, what do you do? Right? <coughs> After the fact, it's simple, but you can't, of course, we can't trade yesterday's price. So, you know, how many people have this feeling that, you know, they kind of take profits too early, okay? And, and how about people, they, they sell too late? Okay, you can't think that way because what you have to do is say, today, I made a trade, and today, based on that best information I had, I decided to sell. If you feel, if you have that emotion, ah, you know what, I sold too early, you're not executing well. What you then need to do is say, you know what, I'm gonna take a third of my position off. I'm just not sure, but I, I, I think it's time to sell. And if it keeps going up, you're long two thirds of your position, you're still making money. That's better execution. If you feel after the fact that you didn't do the right thing, your execution's flawed, for sure. And the same thing at the bottom. Okay, so scaling in and scaling out of trades and positions are going to help you mitigate that emotional response. So let's see, let's see in real time here. So how many people feel without looking at time at the bottom or what the ticker is that they can effectively analyze stocks? 
and charts. Nobody? I scared the, scared it, okay. So you can all do this without knowing the company. Because that's theoretically technical analysis if we're just evaluating the picture should help us. Now, forget the fact that there's no volume or other things. Let, let's play a little game here. So given this setup here, so we've got this stock and it is an equity, okay? It's, it's had a big run, it's had a pullback, it's back around $19, okay? We've got this trend line that I'm gonna say is relatively material. So based on this chart alone and this chart only, how many people are buyers right here? Okay, so I would say a bit more than half. How many people are sellers? Okay, far less. So most people are buyers here. So let's page forward here. And there's our same trend line. And so most of us were buyers on that trend line. And for some number of weeks after, it kept going lower. So having violated a trend line like that and having broken another one, how many people then would have stopped out at some point of those buyers? Okay. Now, if you bought it at 19 and now it's now at 18, don't you like it more when it's at 18? Yeah? I, I would think so. If you bought it at 19, don't you like it better at 18 if I get to buy it cheaper? So why would you get out of it? So the point is that if you're going to buy something and, and get out of it at some arbitrary point lower, because you've got some risk management rules, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, when you evaluate it, you want to say, okay, if I buy it at 18 and the trend line breaks, I'm going to get out. Actually, that's bunk. That's nonsense. Because I could show you a thousand examples of charts like that, where it violates for a day, a week, three days, five days, and then turns around. You've got to have a more robust model than that. That's going to play with your mind and it's going to screw you up. So now, given this chart, okay, it's at 26 roughly, looks like maybe a double top. We definitely have seen a period of volatility relative to history. Given that, how many people would sell or go short? Okay, how many people would buy it right there? Less, so more people are negative at this point. So let's have a look then. So there we are, so that did, actually play out to be a top and now we've broken that intermediate support and we know from double top kind of rules that we have a measured move so that measured move now would take us down to about just under five dollars so given that break we're now at 1267 how many people are still short how many people would buy it right here having not met the price objective how many people are just screwing with me because I know I'm fucking with them? <laughs> okay. Okay, so reality is that was about the bottom. It played out over a number of months and now turned higher. So now we have trading the hard right edge. Given that pattern, how many people would be bearish here? We would sell or go short? How many people are bullish here? Okay, so hands go up, hands go down, hands go up. We all have different ways of approaching the market. And that speaks to my exact point that we're all wired differently. We all have our biases. We all have been trained and taught and learned. There's no right or wrong, folks. Doesn't matter what indicator you use. It's how you execute. Period, stop. There's nothing else that's more important. Check your opinion at the door. Make money. Okay. Okay, so had you got out there, you would have been wrong. It broke out a few days later. It held the breakout point, and now we have that. So now we have another trend line, okay? <laughs> and so it's broken that trend line, traded up to 100, now coming back down and uh, at 56. So how many people don't like that and think it might come back to test the breakout? That's a reasonable analysis, isn't it? Yeah. How many people would buy it there having just broken that trend line? Okay, you're full of shit. <laughs> uh, and, and now, so we know that trend line broken, retest, that's a negative, right? You, you want to be short there, you want to be out, right? Okay, so now let me do this. 
It's Apple. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, so now, knowing that it's Apple, would you have thought about it differently? Be honest with yourself. Of course you would have. Don't be silly. Of course you would have. So hindsight bias is easy. After the fact, we can draw our lines and say, hey, look at that. But be honest with yourself. On the hard right edge of the chart, it's about executing and doing it well. Okay? Make no mistake about that. So do you keep a trading journal? That was an excellent recommendation. I've been writing daily for over 20 years. And I say something and I go back and I go, oh, really? I, that's what I thought back then? Wow, was I stupid. But, but I wasn't because that was the best thing that I thought at the time. I just happened to be wrong. So there's a big difference between, between being a technical analyst and I was on the sell side for many years and actually running portfolios. Very, very different. So you can't buy yesterday's price when it comes to hindsight. Now, uh, just looking at my clock here. So here's our chart again. Now, I can never... You might be bullish on that, but I, I could never stick with that. Given how I know me, okay, the volatility when it goes through a period like that, and if you look at scale, so we got up to uh, here roughly uh, just under $60 and at the down under 40 I mean, I can't handle being in a stock like that with that kind of volatility. It doesn't work for me. So I'm never going to be able to capture all the upside on that. There, in fact, there isn't a moving average I could put on there that, that's reasonable that would keep me in that trend the whole period of time. Okay, so when I look at that, I just have a difficult time with a stock like that. It doesn't suit my eye. I'm a value investor at heart. So I set up my indicators and my tools to help me be a better value investor. I'm never going to be a momentum trader. It's just not me. That, and I'm good with that. <laughs> you know, it's like Warren Buffett just doesn't understand technology. And so when Berkshire Hathaway got cut in half from 1998 to 2000, when the S&P doubled, you all of a sudden, Warren Buffett's a bad investor? No. All the money was coming out of Procter & Gamble and all the value in insurance companies and banks and feeding the dot, whatever. And it didn't make him any less of a, a manager. That style just went out of favor. And we know by looking at advanced decline lines that the, for the U.S. market, the advanced decline line peaked in 1998. And the average stock went down at that point. But the markets went up considerably. So anchoring. So anchoring is a big problem. I got to tell you, nobody cares where you bought your stock but you and maybe your shareholders. So if you bought something at 50 and it's at 45 and you have this overwhelming bias to want to get even before you get out, you're, the, you, you can't have that. You just got to get away from that. You've got to process it and frame it that, okay, it hasn't worked out. Can I sell this at 45 and buy something else that's going to go up more? And again, this is where relative strength analysis can help us quite a bit. Okay, so a stock like this, bought it at 70. Okay, it's currently at 50. I'll, I'll buy, I'll get out when I break even. Okay, and in fact, I have a client who uh, likes to trade some of his own stocks. I manage most of his wealth, but he likes to trade these things. And he said that exactly me. I bought this near 70, right at the peak. Oh my God, what an idiot I was. But I'm going to hang on till it gets back there. And I said, Hirsch, why don't you take that 50 and buy something else that might have better upside? Can't do it. And that, that's, that's Hirsch, okay? So... The market doesn't care where you bought your stock, only you do. What Kramer says or anyone else is irrelevant to your position. If you, if you hear someone say something negative about what you have, I made this mistake years ago. Um, 1991, I was trading uh, OEX options on the S&P 100, and I had a great trading system. Ralph Acampora, founder of IFTA, um, says on Louis Rukeyser's show something that was against my opinion. You know, I, like, so I'm trading the market, and he was bullish or bearish, and I don't remember which at the time. And I said, well, Ralph, I'm, I'm new in the business, a couple years. Ralph obviously knows. So I closed my position out, and sure enough, a week later, that option would have doubled in value. 
And so a couple years later, I did an internship with the MTA in New York, and I met Ralph for the first time, and I told him the story. And he smacked me on the back of the head. He said, what are you listening for me, to me for? I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> I don't know anything about your position. I was talking to Ma and Pa Smith in, in Des Moines, Iowa, on Louis' show. What did that have to do with you? I'm like, you know what, you're right. It had nothing to do with me. I'm never gonna listen to you again. <laughs> so risk management, folks, is the number one key to success, and the market is far smarter than anyone uh, is. Uh, representativeness bias, and that is, Really, a lot of people go on gut feel, and there's, there's a game that we're not gonna have time to play afterwards, but um, again, if, if you go with a lot of gut, that's okay, okay? That's okay as long as the rules are there to get you out when you need to be out, okay? So it's okay with going for gut, but if that gut turns into stubbornness, then that's a problem. So, quick test from Monnier's book. Bat and a ball together cost $1.10. Bat cost a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, I know many of you may have seen this before, certainly if you've read his book, and you know the answer. But what's the, what's the gut question, the answer here? What's the gut answer? The gut answer is 10 cents. Can you look at it in the way the question's set up? And I see some people trying to, to do some quick math there. So the ball cost a nickel and the bat cost $1.05. Because the spread between, or sorry, the spread between them is a dollar. But the gut feel is 10 cents. Because you say a dollar, dollar 10, 10 cents. And that spread would be 90, so that's not correct. So those of you who your initial gut reaction was 10 cents, you tend to, to you tend towards that. And when they looked at portfolio managers, when they evaluated the questions that all these portfolio managers answered, the guys who answered this one wrong tended to be more seat of the pants and had more volatility in their returns. Interesting. Okay, very interesting. Recency bias is, is the impact of paying too much attention to what's going on now. Yesterday's price action, the day before, the latest news, uh, those kind of things. Um, you know, are you bullish or bearish? Okay, this is actually a trick question. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be bullish or bearish. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't care. You should execute. That, that's the, that's the, the trick here. Buy, sell, or hold, doesn't matter, right? It's execution. So, um, and it's all about time frame too. Someone calls into the show and asks me about a certain stock and I, I say, here's where support is, here's where resistance is. If it broke below there, I wouldn't own it. Okay, because then we've started to make lower lows and lower highs, no telling how far down the trend can go. Sector is underperforming, it's out of favor right now. That's the input I give them. I'm not bullish or bearish. I just, these are the facts as I read them. And that's kind of how I approach things. And it, it helps. So you've got two uh, options on a, on a $10,000 investment. So you're, you're, you're up $1,000, you take the profit now, but there's a very high probability in the next month that you'll be up 1,100. Given those two, how many people would take the 1,000 now and lock it in? How many people would wait a month? Okay? And then again, they pose similar questions like this to, to the managers. And the managers who were more patient and more diligent and understood that that extra one month gave them an annualized return of 12%, the, these guys tended to have better performance. They tended to be less sensitive to, oh, the here and now. Interesting, in terms of recency. And I'm gonna speed along here. Uh, very often, I can show you a chart like this, and I can paint the picture for you and say, based on that, this is a chart of gold, how many people are bearish, right? I mean, this is a bearish chart. Folks, this is really ugly. You wanna short this, you wanna get out. I'm doing a presentation in front of a group of uh, clients, and I'm telling you this is wrong. And you know what, a week later I'm doing the same presentation and I'm selling you how bullish this is now because this line has broken, okay? This is what we do. This is what technical analysis, analysts do. And I gotta tell you, there, I think there's a problem with it. I'm not sure what the problem is, but I've seen this so many times, uh, whether it's an economist showing graphics and the next month number changes and then the, you know, 
opinion changes. Uh, so again, in the sake of time, and I know I got to be tight here, I'm going to flip through these in terms of status quo bias and just uh, go to the solutions and then we'll ask for some questions. So folks, self-awareness is the key. You know, read, read Kahneman, uh, read Thinking Fast and Slow. As you go through the book, ask yourself the question, is this me? Does this impact me? And really, uh, the idea of positive psychology or positive framing you know, if you've driven into work uh, on a day and you nearly missed an accident and you spilled coffee on yourself and you're aggravated that day, your probably performance that day shouldn't ma be making any important decisions. You're probably not going to do well. In fact, I did a study with a group of people and I speak across Canada uh, and lecture about markets and we did some priming studies. We gave half the group a uh, card to read and answer questions with positive uh, outlook on it and half the group with a negative outlook on it and then we asked them the identical questions and we saw statistically meaningful differences between their responses based on how we primed them. And so again, going into the trading day, coming in with just a, a negative feeling at a fight with your spouse in the morning, whatever it is, you're probably going to have a bad day. Not good or bad, it's just the way it is, but be aware of it, okay, because it's going to have an impact on you. Keep a trading journal. Very important you understand because that is going to help you make the next trade better. Knowing that you're going to get, if you're good at it, 40% of the time when you make a trade, you're going to have a negative P&L. Knowing that if you executed well and followed your rules, you've made a great trade. Now what can you do next time better to improve that? Maybe it's looking at the risk-reward ratio, ratio a little bit better, saying that, okay, I'm on that trend line, the market sold off, bigger picture, I like this in the context of the next year or two. If it breaks the trend line, who gives a shit? Okay, really. It's going to break it, now I can buy it a little cheaper. So you know what? Buy half a position there. And if it goes down and finds support a little bit lower, buy the other half. Make the next decision a better one. Um, none of these things I'm talking about, by the way, have anything to do with technical analysis. It's all about execution. And I, th I believe that if you want to get better at this, it's, that's where you need to focus on, managing your uh, motion and executing better uh, that are going to improve your success factors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. That was very interesting indeed. Um, how did you make the transition from being on the uh, sell side to then the buy side? Because obviously, psychologically, that made a big difference to your life, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, well, the bank I was working for screwed me over, so I didn't have a choice um, to make the transition. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I've always wanted to be a portfolio manager. That was always the dream from day one, to hang my own shingle and make my own way. And uh, but in terms of executing, it, it, the first couple of years were tough because, you know, timing-wise, end of 2006, I went out on my own, got registered with the regulators. We launched our first fund uh, October 1st, 2007. The S&P made its high a week later, and then the world fell apart for two years. <laughs> so it was very. But I learned a lot along that along the way, um, and. Uh, I tell you, all the rules that we learned about stops and reversals, when the volatility got insane in 08 and 09, I had to rewrite the book. Because for me, what I had learned, almost nothing worked during that environment. Saw these reversal patterns, okay, get in, oh, new low the next day, stop out. That just, that kills you. Now as a technical analyst, you can change your view and opinion and you don't feel it in the pocket. But when you got client money there and you're getting nav erosion, that plays with your mind. And so what I learned through that period is that I got, just got to step back, be more objective and say, not the here and now, not the recency of the volatility, but is this where I want to be long looking out a year or two? And I have to be able to live with the volatility. And if I can't live with the volatility at the time, I can't take a full position and then scaling. And that's really helped me with that. Um, that. So I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but it was, it was a very uh, emotional ride through that. Um, and uh, I had to kind of rethink the way I approach markets because as an analyst and as a portfolio manager, again, dramatically, dramatically different. 
Sharon, thank you for an excellent pr presentation. Um, I, I hear what you say that execution is absolutely the key to your decision making. Um, you've mentioned that you're a value um, investor or look, looking for value opportunities um, as well as technical analysis. How would you summarize the interplay between the two? Do you um, sort of size your positions according to whether they're both reinforcing each other or is there some sort of strategy that you have for sort of using both methods? Yeah, so I, I try to evaluate risk and return. Um, so um, as a value investor, I, I like relative strength. That's always been a favorite thing of mine. And so when I see stocks we like fundamentally um, and they get oversold uh, relative to uh, like a regression analysis, so relative strength, we're, we're taught we want to buy what's outperforming. So uh, I think about differently. I think about mean reversion better. So uh, looking at when something I like big picture fundamentally gets oversold, it's on sale. And so I look at it and say, OK, if I buy it here, where do I not want to own this? And so I look, so, well, if it starts making lower lows and lower highs, typically. So I evaluate where that is and say, OK, now I figure out my position size based on that. So I tend to do a lot of scaling. Gold broke 1,200 recently. So one of the funds I run, uh, I had orders from 1,200 to 1,175. You know, there's a double bottom 1,175. And I, I want to get filled on half a position in case we get a triple bottom, and it holds. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I might dig my heels in and say, you know what, it's going to break lower, and I'll wait for that. And if it doesn't, I didn't make any money. So I've not executed well, and I have not benefited my clients. So I think there's a good probability, let's call it 20 or 30 percent, that that holds. And so I want to get a position on in case it holds. If it breaks, I know that everyone else here that's looking at charts is going to puke. And I want to take advantage of that, be on the right side of that market emotion. And that's where I'll fill a full position as we go through that uh, upheaval. And I take advantage of being on the right side of that. Um, and you know what? If it holds and I only get a third of a position on, who cares? I've added value. And that's how I, I process and think about it. Larry, I think we're out of time now. There's a famous song in Australia by a group called the Skyhooks from the 1970s called Ego is Not a Dirty Word. I think in the trading it definitely is. Thank you very yeah. much, Larry. Thank you.